Next week on Thursday, Chapter 6, Pineapple Juice. The hearing lasted no more than an hour. It was an endless, exhausting hour. The lump of lead in my heart grew heavier as Harold and I made our way back in silence to the vehicle. The parking attendant handed the keys over. He made inconsequential remarks regarding the rest of the day that I barely heard and didn't acknowledge. Harold looked pale and drained. Let's stop somewhere for lunch, he said. I could barely make out his words. Food was the last thing on my mind. We could have a drink if you like, I suggested in compromise. He nodded and stuck the key into the ignition. The engine obliged and roared into life. I sank into the passenger's seat. If only I could shut my eyes and wish him well again, the way he used to be. Harold pulled into a plaza, parked and stepped out unsteadily. He allowed me to help him across the threshold of the restaurant, which was not a good sign. Try the pineapple juice. You'll like it, he mouthed when we settled ourselves at a table by the window. This time I read his lips without difficulty. Sure. Sounds good. I pretended to peruse the menu. I didn't feel like a drink. I understood him now. So what happened in the morning? I had to make a conscious effort not to relive the courtroom experience. The waitress placed two frosty glasses on the table. I was accustomed to the looks. I barely noticed her curious glance. I allowed myself to relax and pressed my lips around the drinking straw, my eyes resting on the man who sat opposite me. Harold took one sip of his juice and began to splutter. An anguished sense of deja vu gripped me by the throat. I remembered Pauline. It was as if I was watching her suffer all over again. Harold gesticulated with his finger towards his neck. I fumbled with the tie and hastily undid the top button of his shirt, thrusting a wad of paper napkins into his hand and patting him weakly on the back. I realised I wasn't helping and sat on the edge of my chair, tense and helpless, while he retched and coughed himself to exhaustion. Yellow juice and saliva spattered all over the rumpled shirt. A burden of desolation and grief settled inside me like a ton of granite. I was losing this vital, clever man who had become my friend. Harold stood up to find the men's room. He approached the waitress and made flailing gestures as he attempted to inquire where it was. I hurried over to help. The woman asked if I was with him, as if I were his caretaker. There didn't seem any point in lingering. We abandoned our almost untouched drinks and Harold drove me back to the Wiseman residence where my car was waiting. He parked in the driveway and we sat quietly for a few seconds to collect our thoughts. Would you like to pop in and see my garden? I inquired on impulse. My home was on his way back to the office. Harold nodded gleefully. His eyes lit up. For just one moment, the one look vanished and he became a schoolboy plotting to play truant. I experienced a sudden pinprick of anxiety. What if he didn't think the garden anything special after all? I drove on ahead. Harold followed. We stood side by side in the drowsy mid-afternoon, lulled by the babble of fountain water. 
Harold feasted his eyes on the riot of purple petunias, pansies and morning glory splashed all around us. A restful smile gentled his countenance and set my fears at rest. I was the kindergartner who got to usher her favourite teacher home. I pointed out my treasures, the copper squirrel's tail sundial, the rocks, seashells and driftwood I had gathered on my rambles over the years. Lines of exhaustion clawed at his features. It's cooler inside. Let's go in and sit for a bit, I said. You look tired. The twins were at school. The house was silent. I could hear Harold's breath rattling in the stillness as we sat for a while on the couch in the family room. David phoned to find out how the morning had gone. I told him Harold was visiting and I'd call back later. I hung up and the dam burst. The tension of the day punched me in the guts and I wept as I'd never wept before. I can't bear to see what's happening to you, I sobbed. I'm sorry you had to endure this morning. He looked helpless and uncomfortable. Too weary to make an attempt at speech, he pointed vaguely in the direction of the box of tissues on the coffee table. I grabbed a fistful of Kleenex, scrubbed my face with it, and blew my nose. We have to discuss what's to be done with the litigation. The, the litigation, we, we can talk about it when I come to the office on Thursday. I, I, I mumbled. His lips moved and through a froth of bubbling spittle he mouthed, What are you going to do after I leave? Again, I understood what he said. If only the morning had been like that. Don't go there. A mountain of laundry, I said, and I have to cook dinner. Not very ro romantic. There's romance in everything. I sounded despondent. It just depends on how one views the situation. We walked outside into the driveway. Harold wound his stick arms around me. He held me close for some seconds before thrusting himself awkwardly into his vehicle. I looked into the glumness in his eyes and a familiar frog leapt to my throat. He shouldn't have been behind the wheel of that behemoth. He shouldn't, have, he shouldn't have been driving at all. A vigorous wave of my hand, a fabricated smile, and I headed back into the house. I needed an hour by myself to weep my heart out, pound the walls, howl, yell and scream, Why? To be continued.